Welcome to the Back to Health podcast, where we share inspirational stories of hope to help you reclaim your health. If you're suffering from a chronic condition and have been given little to no hope, if you've been told that there's nothing wrong with you, but you know there definitely is something wrong, or if you're just trying to be preventative and want to know how to reclaim your health, then this podcast is for you. I can't wait to share today's episode. Hello, hello, it's the Back to Health podcast and I'm your host, Rashani Mahendran. Today, we are talking about Gut Health 101. So we're taking you all the way from the basics to some of the more advanced stuff so that you can really get in control of your gut health. My guest today is the wonderful Trish Whetstone, and Trish is the Feel Good Gut Coach, a holistic health specialist, stress expert, and intuitive eating advocate. She became a certified health, life, and nutrition coach to help herself after years of struggling with IBS. And now she helps others through nutrition, stress management, and lifestyle change so they can feel good in their gut. Catch her co-hosting the podcast, Ice Cream, You Scream, within the Feel Good Gut Facebook group on Instagram as at Feel Good Gut Girl, or you can visit her website. All the links will be in the show notes, but let's dive into today's conversation because it's a really good one. Welcome to the show, Trish. So lovely to have you here. Yes, thank you for having me. I'm really excited to chat with you today. Yeah, and we're going to dive into obviously a very up and coming area of a lot of interest to a lot of people. And I think lots of people have so many different takes on this particular topic. Mm. As well. It feels like it's never just enough to have like one conversation about <laughs> health and what we can do for our gut. Um, but that's why it's so exciting to have you on today to give us your perspective and share your journey and your story of how you got here and, and why this area is so important for all of us to sort of look at. So maybe you'd just like to start at the beginning and, and sort of your journey and how you got into gut health. Yeah, absolutely. So I think um, you really hit the nail on the head when you said it's it's very different and individualized for everybody. And like, we could probably talk about gut health for, like, I mean, I know I could for episodes and episodes, but really I think my story does kind of encapsulate just how profound, you know, poor gut health had on, on my health. And this was my late teens, early 20s, really growing up, I was very healthy. I didn't have any health concerns. But during the time in college and my first career in the human services world, I was under a lot of stress. And um, my bowel movements started to get weird. I felt like I always had normal bowel movements. And all of a sudden, they were irregular. And I, you know, would start to have joint pain. And my skin was breaking out. And my mental health was kind of faltering a little bit. And I realized that gut health was kind of at the core. Um, And it seems simple to say, okay, a lot of things cause fatigue and skin breakouts and digestive concerns. But I use the dramatic example of saying, you know, I was in my 20s and I felt like I was waking up feeling like I get hit by a bus, (laughs) which shouldn't be how I should feel at that age. No one should feel like that. But especially as a young woman who would go to doctors and my vitals were fine. They say, you're fit. Your blood work looks okay. We don't really see anything here. Um, And I kind of got this vague diagnosis of IBS. And my gastroenterologist even said, you know, most young women in their 20s have IBS. And I was like, I don't want to really believe that, (laughs) first off. And second off, you know, I don't want to live like this. I don't want to, you know, just necessarily have to deal with this. So I started to research the gut um, for myself, started to make nutritional changes and then some lifestyle changes, certainly focused on stress management. And during this time when I was just kind of, you know, endlessly searching on Google, (laughs) believe it or not, my first health coaching program came up as an advertisement. And I was like, health coaching, okay, this seems holistic and it seems very person-centered. And I think that's what I need because I never fully felt heard from the medical community. And then even, you know, my support system that didn't really fully understand gut health and what was happening I felt like an outsider. So that's why I joined the health coaching world. And then, you know, over the years as I healed myself, I kind of developed this passion and said, I want to help other people do the same. Yeah. And it's always so interesting whenever I hear anyone's story about how they got into a particular area, it always stems from our own story and our own healing. But I'd like to go back to that bit that you said where, you know, you're almost left to just Google and it sort of It leads me to think, what would we do if this information wasn't out there on the internet? Like, Mm -hmm. what did people do when they were diagnosed with something, but literally given little to no options and then left to fend for themselves? Like, you know, we're all left to sort of go and find the things. And I, I am very grateful that nowadays, especially gut health in general, there's so much research and there's so much evidence based knowledge and there's so many 
people sharing their knowledge about gut health because it has been researched so thoroughly now that it is easier and easier to find what you're looking for but it wasn't always the case so so where would you suggest that someone who's sort of thinking oh this could be me I'm having these breakouts or I'm feeling fatigued or I'm feeling some of these you know joint pain is maybe one of the biggest Mm. ones that no one would think to look at gut health for your joint pain like something's wrong with my bones like I need to go to the gym and pull more weights or I need to like exercise more and no one talks about gut health when it comes to joint pain which is one of the links I find super interesting where where should where should people start like where can people start Mm, yeah I think that's a great question and I do think it instead of just randomly googling and going into like um, community forums. I think community is really helpful, but I think a lot of community forums around gut health um, are people's own personal experience, but not really always backed by research. So I think that you can go down a spiral. Like I've seen people say, you know, what supplement should I take? And then you have 400 people (laughs) giving you different examples or answers. So I think it is following professionals that you resonate with in the area. Um, So I think there's a couple of doctors I really love just off the top of my head, Dr. Vincent Pedre, um, Dr. Mark Hyman, he's here in the Cleveland area where I live. Um, Some doctors who really specialize in that functional medicine practitioners or holistic practitioners. And then, you know, health coaches or dietitians, maybe like myself or other people on social platforms that again, maybe have personal experience. So they're going to be empathetic and they're going to be real with you, but they also have some training. And I think you're going to get a lot more good information. I do believe knowledge is power, but knowledge doesn't automatically create behavior change. But I think this is the perfect place to start is finding professionals that you resonate with that are real. Um, And then of course, you know, I always link, and I think a lot of dietitians and functional medicine practitioners will link and reference specific studies in books that you can then read. Um, So I do think that books and professionals are the place to start. And there's plenty to find on Google there, you know, over just forums and random searches. (laughs) Yeah, I totally agree. And there are some brilliant, brilliant books around gut there health. Are. Do you have uh, like a top pick for us or top two yes. or three books? Um, oh gosh, and I always blank, but Happy Gut by Dr. Vincent Pedre. Um, and then um, Healthy Gut, Healthy You by Dr. Yes. Mark Ruscio is a fantastic a one. Book. Yes. And there's a couple more, but those are the two that popped in my head right away. I've, I've read quite a few over the years, but those ones are great places to start because I think both of those also are very digestible um, if you're someone who hasn't studied science. So those are great places to start. Yeah. And that's sometimes what the struggle can be is that you want to learn about a particular area of the body, but then it uses lots of like scientific medical terms and it become it can become so overwhelming that you're like, uh, I think this is a bit too, no- I want to go and speak to somebody. I just want to go and speak to somebody in yeah. English who's going to give me like the, you know, the exactly. lowdown, but then without, without it being overwhelming and just say, you know, but then on the other extreme, you don't want the, you know, you just want the doctor that says, take some probiotics and it will all be okay, because that's probably exactly. the worst advice you can get when it comes to your gut health. So maybe you'd like to talk to us a little bit about probiotics and sort of yes. where, it, where it can work and where, where we need to look a bit further, maybe. Oh, I'm so glad you you asked that question because I do think that that's the buzz in the gut health world. As you kind of mentioned, there's a lot of buzz because gut health is important, more people are experiencing gut issues, you know, in recent years. And we always think, I actually did a question um, on my social platform a while ago, what's the first thing that pops in your head when I say gut health? And so many people said probiotics. And essentially probiotics are beneficial bacteria. We have a microbiome within our gut of healthy and unhealthy bacteria. Ultimately, we want a balance here. We want more healthy bacteria. So it seems logical to say, let's supplement and let's just put bacteria, good bacteria in our body. Um, And I think a couple of things with probiotics is, one, regardless of whether it's a probiotic that is actually fueling you, that that bacteria is getting past the stomach acid, it's not going to be the cure-all, especially when you have really intense gut issues. Typically, I tell people if you're healthy and you just kind of want to supplement and kind of prevent gut issues, probiotics are typically more useful than if you're looking to cure a very long-term digestive problem that's been happening for years. And the reason that is, is because like I mentioned, some probiotics are not as high quality, so they don't always get past the stomach acid. I do think food-based probiotics from fermented foods are great because you're getting the nutrients from the food as well. Things like, you know, of course, yogurts, um, 
kimchi and, and uh, fermented foods like that. But then there is some research showing that some probiotics, um, certain strains can actually feed the fire for some gut issues like small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, SIBO. Um, and what, what the research is finding with probiotics is it is very much um, specific to the case and the strain. So there's thousands, we have thousands of bacteria in our gut. And to say, I'm going to take two strains and that's going to fix my whole gut problem and gut issues is not necessarily the case. So I think it's just important to be careful and do some research, work with a practitioner to find some strains that work for you. Overall, I tell people it's likely trial and error and don't feel like you have to sink loads and loads of money into probiotics because they might just be part of the picture for you and they really are not necessarily the cure-all. Yeah, and let's touch on that point you made because when I first heard this, I was super surprised because some pri probiotics, if you have like a candida issue or you have like a SIBO, you're yeah. actually feeding the bad bacteria. So you're making mm -hmm. the issue that you have worse than it already is because they thrive off the probiotics too and yep. this blew my mind because it's like where's that in all the literature where's that in all the stuff that you're reading um because <laughs> i'm taking probiotics because it's the buzzword and everyone's telling me it's good for my health and i'm gonna go buy these expensive strains of bacteria and put them into my body but that's actually feeding my bad bacteria and making yes. it worse so where should people start to actually diagnose or you know understand their body to know do I have SIBO? Do I have Candida? Yes. And then what should I do rather than I just go buy the probiotics and just put them into my body? Yes, exactly. So I think um, the simplest place to start for any gut issue, if you're like not sure if you have SIBO, Candida, you know, IBD, different conditions, is to start eating cleaner. In general, just clean up the diet, less processed foods. Maybe you do add in a probiotic if that's the route you want to take and you don't want to spend a lot of money. And if you're not seeing substantial shifts, most people will feel at least a little bit better. <laughs> but a lot of times I work with clients who were already eating clean and they're very much like they eat healthy and they're quite active and they're still having issues. That is a sign that you know, everybody's gut will respond to clean eating, but you know, that's a sign that you have something bigger going on underneath the surface. And I think when it comes to candida and SIBO, both of them do um, respond poorly to things like probiotics, as you mentioned, but also carbohydrates and sugars because they feed off of those. And I am a big advocate for saying that carbs are not bad. Not all carbs are created equal, but sugar and things like gluten and dairy, those are some of the biggest triggers for the gut. And if you're finding you're really having issues with this and even carbohydrates like rice, for example, are upsetting you, then it's likely that maybe it's either candida or SIBO that's kind of feeding off of that food. And it doesn't mean we need to label that as bad, but hmm, okay, that's an indication that maybe something is going on underneath the surface. So I just think it's if these surface level things aren't working and then carbohydrates and things are happening. And I would say in general, um, if you have a lot of secondary symptoms. So I like to say gut issues, we always think digestive. <laughs> like, you know, okay, my bowel movements, those are weird. But if you have a lot of fatigue, brain fog, things like joint pain, like we mentioned, skin issues like rashes, uh, psoriasis, acne, that is likely that there is, again, kind of a more complex issue underneath the surface if you have a multitude of symptoms and it's not just a little like heartburn here and there. Yeah, I think that makes good sense. And actually, for me, this was a really interesting point, because when I first started having bloating and I was thinking, oh, it must be the gluten, like I'm going to get rid of the I, I was already dairy free because I'm lactose intolerant. So I'll get mm. rid of the gluten and the bloating was still happening. I'm like, oh, mm. OK, what else? And I, I was already pretty cl like pretty clean in terms of diet. Mm -hmm. So no processed foods, no refined sugar, all of that. Yeah. Like, what else is it? What else could be causing this? Um, and so I, I decided to go off rice for a week. And the bloating issues just disappeared. And I never thought that rice could be the issue. Like rice, <laughs> it's, it's gluten free, you know, I mean, like, right. like that. so why would rice be the issue? And oats is all, or oats was also like a slight trigger for me as well. So I was like, mm -hmm. ah, like it, we, we, we tend to default to it's the, the main culprits, the dairy, the wheat, yes. that, you know, but sometimes it can be the rice, the potatoes, the oats, the other things that can feed mm -hmm. um, something like candida um, that you don't realize. So sometimes it's like almost like elimination and then you need to like, 
experiment to like put things back in or back out um, yes. to be able to figure out what is it that's triggering my body and what is causing these because it's not the same for everyone and it's not just like the whole world goes on a gluten-free diet or the whole world avoids all these <laughs> things although in general you may want to look at the quality of the gluten and the dairy and stuff you're yes, putting into your body um, but it's not a one size fits all it's not just like if everyone eats this way then everyone's problems are going to be solved because our yeah. bodies are sensitive and we all react to different things um so could you talk a little bit maybe about like allergies and sort of how they can be related to the gut because obviously different people have different allergies and some people are more sensitive to others but i've been reading a lot about that recently and how actually if you work on your gut you can actually reverse some of the allergic reactions you have to things as well yes absolutely so basically what's at the core here is that our gut houses about 80, 70 to 80% of our immune system. So our gut lining has all these immune cells and really, you know, allergies and, and things like that are immune responses. So your body's immune system is kind of attacking that food molecule or in things like autoimmune conditions where we see a food sensitivity, your body's kind of attacking itself because it, it uh, mistakenly recognizes your own tissue as foreign. And essentially these are all immune issues. The immune system is housed in our gut. So it would make sense that if we have an unhealthy gut, it can affect this immune response. So this can absolutely be true, of course, for foods. So some people find one of the main mechanisms that might be at play is a simple food sensitivity like lactose intolerance, right? Like you mentioned. And a lot of times with things like lactose intolerance, I call that level one food sensitivity and allergy, <laughs> like peanuts, you know, are in this realm as well. You get rid of it and then you're likely okay. And there might be digestive upset involved with that. Then there are the category of allergies, like seasonal allergies. Like I never had allergies growing up. And then when my gut issues were bad, I'm like, am I allergic to pollen and dust and what? <laughs> like all of a sudden I was getting, you know, sinus issues that can be really common with um, poor gut health as well. Um, and in this category is also maybe the sensitivities to not only gluten, but other grains as well, like you mentioned, like rice and oats and things of that nature. Um, you know, and then of course there are serious, serious allergies, life threatening and um, autoimmune responses. But essentially um, some of the things that's at play here is leaky gut. And this is a concept that's not necessarily diagnosable, but it's well recognized in even the medical world and the holistic health community that basically we have these tight junctions that hold our intestines together and they're semi-permeable so they let some food molecules through but what happens when have some when someone has leaky gut it kind of becomes too leaky and then we're finding that undigested food molecules are getting through this lining here and a lot of times this is kind of structurally what is damaged when someone has different gut issues and this can be a huge factor in why um, allergens then kind of are, are swept into the bloodstream and we start to, your body says, well, why is this undigested food here? We're going to kind of start to attack it and have a sort of allergic reaction or sensitivity to it. So it's sometimes, um, you know, not just the unregulated immune response within the gut, but really this leaky gut happening as well. And what can, what can people do if they, if they suspect they might have a leaky gut? What are the steps that we yeah. can take to fix that? Yeah, so it's a lot of the same steps for other gut issues as well. It's really finding an individualized diet for you. And I think that's the, the problem is, unfortunately, I can't give you a one size fits all here. But it is, you know, getting rid of trigger foods, and it could be everything from grains to different sugars to, you know, for some people, it's different types of protein. Some people fare better with veganism. A lot of people fare better with more of a meat-based diet. But finding the diet that works for you, um, definitely mediating your stress. So I like to say that stress shows up in four different ways. Mental and emotional. That's what we usually think. That releases cortisol, puts us in fight or flight mode, can affect our gut bacteria, can affect this gut lining. Uh, physical stress is like poor posture and toxins in the environment and uh, physical clutter throughout us, our environment could also stress us out. But then there's biochemical, and that is the foods that we eat. That is the nutrients that we are absorbing or not absorbing. Um, this is the pace at which we eat and how we're eating as well. And all of these things can really kind of disrupt this wonderful motility, the ability of our digestive tract to just run smoothly and sometimes issues like leaky gut 
placebo, as you mentioned, there's not enough motility. And I kind of like to sub that word with mobility. Basically, the food is just not moving through you at a good pace. And so we sometimes need to work on that biochemical stress as well. The pace at which we're eating, um, you know, of course, the quality of our food. Are we stressed out when we're eating? And then there are certain supplements. For example, L-glutamine has shown some promise in helping to heal the gut lining. And basically how I describe that is that's just helping to heal some of that biochemical stress that's happened over time. If you had physical stress like an injury, you would put ointment on it. You would rest your leg, right? Some of the bio chemical stress is hidden and leaky gut is really a result of that. So we might need nutritional supplementation as well. But I think those are some of the general lifestyle things um, that we can do to help heal leaky gut. Yeah, those are great. And let's just talk about supplementation a second, because this is an area I find so fascinating. And there's so much conflicting almost advice in this space, because it's Mm -hmm. like supplementations, you know, they are called supplements, which means they should assist your diet, not become the diet, right? So there's people popping pills for all sorts of things. Like, I don't have enough of this vitamin and that vitamin. It's like, but are you looking at your food? Are you trying to get those nutrients from your food first? And then if you still feel you are at a shortage, then you go and supplement. That's sort of one side of it. And then the other side of it is this thing about synthetic supplements versus the bioavailable and knowing the quality of your supplements and are they food based and are they food grown or are they just made in a lab? And so your body has to work really hard to process them. What Mm -hmm. sort of what sort of stress does supplements and especially synthetic ones put on the gut? Like, Mm. how does that help or not help the gut? Yeah. So I think typically the approach that I like to take that I think makes a lot of sense for most people is coming to a clean slate first. So, you know, I'm thinking of a client off the top of my head who was you know, eliminating a lot of foods, but also just adding in tons of supplements. And they weren't working on the food situation first. (laughs) So like you mentioned, um, I I am a strong, firm believer that our gut actually feeds off of more variety. We shouldn't live in restriction, but it is so helpful to have a clean slate first, really get out, you know, a lot of the, the biggest triggers and then slowly add those back in. And what I think is, if you're adding foods back in, like for example, you you know may have went rice free and oat free, now you're feeling better and like I want to get some gluten free grains maybe back in my diet. During that time, you can also maybe supplement with some of those really really high quality food based supplements or ones that are bioavailable. Again, they're less synthetic. One off the top of my head that pops in is like collagen. That's really um, nourishing for the gut, and we can add that to smoothies, and that wouldn't be too harmful, right? However, if we haven't gone through this process and we're afraid to look at food and we're either undernourished because we are too restricted or we're still eating processed foods with a lot of potential triggers, supplementation isn't maybe necessarily going to work at this point as much. Whether or not I think you have those more bioavailable ones or, of course, the the synthetic So I think that it's just, you know, your body isn't going to be able to absorb it as much. We won't necessarily be able to pinpoint, did that help? Or was it when you finally got rid of gluten that helped? Do you really need that supplement or not? Um, And then I think the last point that you said about synthetic supplements is so interesting because before I got into health coaching, I worked in the substance use field. So I'm very keen on educating people on substances (laughs) and supplements don't always work the same as drugs. They don't always change brain chemistry um, or even physiology in the same way. However, there's still something that can impact the physiology of our body in some ways. And I do think it's very important to not overdo it with supplementation. I do think having too many supplements can cause stress on the body especially the less bioavailable ones, like you mentioned, that aren't broken down, that have... um, Fillers. Fillers, exactly, that your body's now trying to process out those and separate the component of that supplement we need and then like the toxic part of the supplement. So it can definitely cause some toxic overload for your body if you're taking too many supplements and you're not researching good ones, you're just getting them off of Amazon. And, you know, so that is very important because I think a lot of us want to jump to that right away. And I just caution people to not jump to it right away. I do think supplementation is often very helpful in gut healing, but it doesn't have to necessarily be your first step. And I think when you do add it into your regimen, looking for the ones that have less fillers, of course, and um, are more clean are really the best way to go. 
Yeah, and I and I think one other important thing that people sort of need to understand is that supplementation is not for the long term, right? It's meant to be like yes. a short term top up of something that you may be deficient in to help you bring you back to health. But once you're there, I think maintenance is meant to be through food as much as possible, unless yep. you then feel that there definitely is an issue in it at a particular point. And um, a lot of people do this based on like just feeling like, oh, maybe I just top up some vitamin C. Maybe I'll top up some vitamin D today. Maybe I'll also add in a vitamin A. And it sort of becomes a really confusing using pile of like I need to take all my vitamins and no judgment here because also when when my kids were younger I was of the same thing like my kids are not always eating everything I'm putting in front of them and so maybe I'll top up a little bit of this and I'll top up a little a little bit of this and then one day I just had to look at my cupboard and I was like this looks ridiculous they're they're supposed to be getting this with their food but yes my daughter at the time was quite a picky eater so I was really worried about like maybe she's not getting like enough iron and she's not getting enough this and and then looking at the cupboard I was like we just can't live like that I can't be giving them like one of everything every single day and that's not how it's supposed to be um Mm -hmm. do you have advice for us around like our kids gut health and how Mm. we can promote that without just relying on supplements because we're worried about them not getting the right mix of whatever cocktail vitamins they're supposed to be getting (laughs) Absolutely. So I think um, early life experiences do have a strong impact on gut health later on in life. So I love that you're asking this question, especially because I used to work with youth (laughs) and I I love, um, you know, trying to promote that health and that wellness early on. So I guess I'll go, I'll rewind really, really back. And first of all, say that some of the choices that you make while pregnant with your children, if you are a woman, um, can really impact your child's development of their gut microbiome. It's like you as um, a mother are kind of feeding your child as well. So eating clean at that point, there is research and there's, I'll preface by saying no judgment here, but if you have the choice and you'd like to, there is research that uh, children will have a stronger microbiome if they are birthed vaginally and if they are um, bottle fed or breastfed rather than bottle fed, because it's almost like if we do a C-section birth or bottle feed, we're putting that child in a more sterile environment and we almost need them to be exposed to this good and bad bacteria. So again, if you bottle feed and C-section, no worries. Those kids who are just birthed vaginally or breastfed might just have a slight one up on the gut microbiome. Um, And research also shows that trying to avoid antibiotic use, excessive antibiotic use in that early, especially the first year, but as children are growing, um, because it's just, it can wipe out the entire microbiome. And I think um, using an approach of trying to go to holistic measures first is of course fantastic because we find we can wipe out our whole gut microbiome when we're young. And then we kind of don't have strains ever recreate or reproduce in our lifetime later on. That's a huge part of chronic gut issues is antibiotic use. So taking a more holistic approach to medicines, if possible, of course, use an antibiotic if it is life-threatening for sure. Um, And then just really focusing on more whole food nutrition. And I think um, an interesting point I want to share is a lot of times I find with the clients I work with, and I found this with myself, so again, no judgment, gut issues have stemmed from maybe unhealthy food, a relationship with food that's unhealthy, like emotional eating and overeating. And I always say that my journey was actually not one of weight loss. It was one of gut healing, but I didn't realize how much I relied on food emotionally and how much I was actually an overeater. And because I was actually losing a little bit of weight when I was really undernourished and my gut health was poor, I thought I should just continue to cram (laughs) food in my stomach. And I was putting a lot of stress on my digestive system. I really had a dependence on sugars and carbs, like sweet tooth is my thing. And I do know those that those likely contributed to the development of my gut issues and they definitely make it made it harder to go clean and make those changes later on so i think just having a really trying to um model a healthy relationship with food in front of your children will be really helpful so that food is medicine and food does nourish us, but then we can also enjoy food and we don't have to restrict as much. And, you know, actually eating whole clean foods is the way it should be. And then we can occasionally splurge, but we don't have to really um, rely on food to deal with our emotions. I do think those are really fantastic things you can do. Of course, within that, you can choose if you want your child to be gluten-free or dairy-free, 
But I think in general, having this relationship with clean food being really nourishing for us and beneficial and something that just fuels us up um, and occasionally gives us pleasure, but isn't the default for pleasure. We can get out and we can be active and we can get take care of ourselves by having enough sleep. All of these habits are going to set your child up for better gut health later on. Although they might seem simple, I do think those are a lot of the root causes of chronic gut issues. I love that you mentioned that because um, one of the things I've been really mindful about is like not using chocolates or sweet treats as 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 a treat like exactly that yes. not using it as a reward not using it as a we'll only have this on special occasions or making it that you know when we have a celebration that's when we go all crazy because that then builds that emotional connection that you're talking about and because I struggled with that emotional detachment of food because we only had certain things when it was a special occasion or only had certain things when we were with a big group of our family or friends and so it became a really emotional sort of attachment that when you got older and you had free reign over your food when you wanted to feel good again or you wanted to remember a particular time you'd go for the foods that help to create those particular moments or those memories mm-hmm. because we are as human beings we are such sen- you know we're very sensory and so the taste and the smells and all the things that we associate with a good memory become very emotional and very sort of like ingrained in us so I'm very keen about my kids not thinking that oh you did really well in that spelling test so here's a chocolate or you did very right. well in this so let's go have a treat and let's go and eat something really bad for us it's like no mm-hmm. when those good things happen I make it a point to say, let's have a really nourishing meal together. Let's go and eat something yeah. really healthy together. Because every time you do something well, you want to nourish your body to allow you to do even better, like do mm-hmm. better things. And then chocolate and whatever, that's like, it's around. And you know, it's not good for you. I've given you all the information. My advice is don't eat it too often. But if you feel like you want to have it from time to time, like I'm not stopping you and it's there. And right. I do obviously try and buy as much like raw, organic, all that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. But sometimes we're gifted stuff, right? And it's in that, mm-hmm. you know, it's there and it's like, you want to try it you want to taste it taste it don't gobble like the whole box of biscuits or the whole box of chocolate have a taste and then you know what it tastes like and then leave it leave it for the next time but I do feel it's really important to start building those healthy habits now so Mm -hmm. children associate good food with good memories and then the, the the extra little you know the things that taste good but aren't so good for us they can have them but like not associate it to any particular event or milestone or any particular memories exactly. um because I don't want that to be their go-to for oh I feel really sick so I'm gonna go have a for example when my daughter used to get tonsillitis she used to have an ice lolly like just a pure orange like orange in her thing but now she's come to associate when she's feeling a bit like down or she's not feeling so well like ice lolly's her go-to thing and like, I don't yeah. need to make that association because we uh, it's not a sugar-loaded ice lolly but but still, we don't want you to start because that could be any ice lolly in the future. It might not be the, mm-hmm. the healthy one I'm giving you, right? You just go buy any ice lolly. And so it's really important we build those like beautiful connections in our kids' brains of good equals healthy and let's nourish ourselves. And then mm-hmm. the other stuff is for as and when if we really feel like we have, you know, we want to we want yeah. to go there sort of thing. Um in terms of antibiotic use, there was a really interesting point that you brought up because as you say, like we should avoid it as much as possible. There's so much research now to show just how damaging antibiotic use can be, especially mm. repeated antibiotic use. But as yep. I mentioned, like my daughter used to have re- recurring tonsillitis. My my son had recurring croup. And so antibiotics is one of the things that you are sort of given. And especially when it comes to a point where they're really struggling with breathing and you know, it, it's, it's like a mm-hmm. tough call. So say you do have to take antibiotics for whatever reason it might be. What are some of the things we can do to help rebuild? As you say, if, we, if we're losing all that microbiome and completely flushing it out, what should we do to help rebuild whether that's for children or adults or whoever takes antibiotics what can we do to rebuild the gut as as quickly as possible once we've had to take the antibiotics yeah i love that question and i think there's a couple of things and one my first this is where probiotics do come into play and i think first it's maybe defaulting to food-based probiotics so things like bone broth like drinking bone broth while you are sick and you are trying to heal right rather than chicken noodle soup <laughs> no no offense against campbells or or anything with you know white pasta but you know bone broth and having you know kimchi or sauerkraut and fermented foods and yogurts and things that a lot of times we will default when we're sick especially if it's a throat infection, I'm going to have ice cream, I'm just going to have the salty yeah. soup, but kind of supplementing with those probiotic based foods would be really helpful. This is also when and, and kind of doing this during the time that you are taking an antibiotic can help um, and potentially supplementing with a probiotic that has a broad spectrum. So typically looking for, you know, over 100 billion CFU, that's a lot of different colonies of bacteria. And it's likely that some of those are going to help rather 
rather than just some, you know, shorter spectrum ones. Um, so I think that that can be definitely beneficial. And there's some research now on spore based probiotics that are soil based that, um, kind of naturally cultivated in a different way than the synthetic ones. And a lot of the same ones that we see in the store-bought brand are lactobacillus and bifidobacterium. And those are a lot of the same spray, uh, strains. So especially if you have had a really serious infection, you had to take a big probiotic or it's been recurring over, over the years, it might be worth looking into those other types of probiotics. I've seen people have some more... Um, some more success with those spore-based probiotics. So I think that that is another thing that you can do. And then lastly, it's just t doing these other lifestyle behaviors that do naturally build and nourish our microbiome, this gut bacteria within our gut. So getting enough sleep, moving, getting sunlight, because that helps regulate our hormones and our blood sugar and managing our stress through different self-care and eating mindfully and all these other uh, habits and behaviors will help, right? I think a lot of times we default to just food and supplementation, and that's part of the picture. I'm not saying getting eight hours of sleep is going to heal your gut issues, but I think being as holistic as possible and almost having confidence that all these little things I'm doing are going to kind of be pieces into this puzzle of building, rebuilding my microbiome and having a healthier gut. So I'm going to know it's totally worth it to take time for myself and get enough sleep and exercise and move my body as well. That's that's great. And then um, I guess the other side of this coin is the going out into nature and like yeah. getting our kids in the dirt. So one of the things yes. I was always told when I was little was like, stay away from the mud. Don't, yes. don't go over there. <laughs> don't get your shoes dirty. Don't bring the dirty shoes into the house. And so that's sort of like ingrained. And, you know, we can be very much like that with our kids, like mind that bit over there. But really what we want them to do is go out into the dirt and just play and touch the stuff rub it on their face you know whatever it might be but just yes. just get dirty like how important is that to um to building up the microbiome yes it's so important and I'm, I'm glad you brought that up and i believe this was because i read and studied different things of gut health i think this might have been dr mark Ruscio, the healthy gut healthy you that i'm referencing here and he i believe said that there's kind of old dirt and new dirt old dirt is like being with animals and being out in nature and getting you know getting into soil and like knowing it's okay when you're on a hike to not wash your hands or use hand sanitizer before eating your apple while you're outside like all those things are mother nature's way of helping us kind of build these microbes against these dirt, right? And this helps strengthen our immune system, especially if you can do this when you're young, when you're a kid. But I think even as adults, we just kind of stray away from this and we're almost too sterile. Um, but the other side of the coin here is that new dirt. So that's things like, you know, you wouldn't eat, you know, pizza that you dropped on the floor of New York City, right? <laughs> the streets of New York City. So like, that is like pollution and, um, you know, viruses, of course, and, and, and uh, bacteria from you know, bacterial infections, of course, and sewage, we would want to avoid those. But old dirt, real dirt, mother nature is a fantastic way to build our immune system. Yeah. And so it all, I mean, this whole last year, I have been wondering so much about everyone sterilizing their hands yeah. so much, you know, spending the whole time. And I've been very um, mindful of finding more natural ways to sort of like sanitize because mm -hmm. at school they have to sanitize their hands and, you know, you're made to do yeah. when you go into shops, but I give my kids natural hand sanitizers and I use natural ones um, because the chemicals and the toxins that you're putting there are yeah. just as harmful, if not more so than anything else you're trying to wash off your hands, right? Yeah. Um, you, you're, exactly. you're, put, you're putting more toxic load into your bodies and think of our little children like with all those chemicals read the bottles of what's in some of those cheaper hand yep. sanitizers and we're putting that into their system now we absorb through our hands that then maybe goes to our eyes our faces our noses whatever and we're ingesting all those chemicals and those toxins and just the way that people are going around blindly just sanitizing their hands like 10 times a day um and I'm just thinking oh you're wiping away all those things that you need yes. to be exposing your bodies to exactly and I've seen people wash their hands and then be like I'm gonna put hand sanitizer on just in case <laughs> and it's like no if you did soap and water that will do the trick right maybe only use hand sanitizer when you are out are out and about on the go and you have that as your only option but I think using you know cleaner brands like you mentioned but yeah I think it's it is an interesting time because of course you know people want to stay safe and and follow guidelines and things and especially kids and public places and schools where it is the rule but I think you know just kind of knowing that it's okay don't overdo it especially when you're in your own home and you can just use soap and water by all means do that um, because it is um 
a bummer. And I, I guess I, I, I don't necessarily know if we're going to see some long term impacts from this year and a half now almost that people have been kind of relying on these. If we're going to see more gut issues pop up, more immune responses pop up because you're killing the bacteria, uh, you know, both good and bad when you use things like this, uh, like hand sanitizer. Yeah, because I do worry that that actually lowers our immunity and especially that yeah. of our children because we're just like not giving them any chance to be exposed to these, um, yeah. you know, the, the, the health, the, not the healthy bacteria, but the bacteria that we want them to be exposed to, to be able to build that microbiome. Um, yeah. So yes, I think I, I'm, I'm with you and it's going to be an interesting time to see just how many issues sort of come out of this. But what mm-hmm. are some of the things that people should look out for to be able to identify do I have a gut issue potentially? Yeah. Uh, like what are the signs and what are the symptoms that people can start looking out for? Absolutely. So we'll start with bowel movements and I'll, I'll kind of say that um, some people can have gut issues with never having abnormal bowel movements or digestive concerns. So I will say that, you know, these other symptoms that I'll say thereafter, sometimes you can just have that and people don't always, that's trickier because people don't always pinpoint it to gut health, right? (laughs) If it's not digestive, but when it comes to digestive concerns, having normal stools, so you can look up the Bristol stool chart to kind of see what the texture and look of your your stool should be. Um, One to three times a day is generally pretty normal. Um, I think a lot of times people think constipation is just not going and diarrhea is just completely loose stool. But if your if your stool is airing on the side of looseness or it's, you know, kind of pellet based, that does mean that you are a little bit airing on the side of constipation. And if these things don't cure after a night out, you know, you had some some bad food and they don't cure. Right. And you're hydrating and you're active and you're still airing on the side of constipation or diarrhea. Of course, your bowel movements are a great indication indication of how well you are eliminating. So that could be, of course, um, kind of the first place to look. And then I think when it comes to other symptoms, it's kind of like, do you have um, the myriad of symptoms? So are you also experiencing skin issues and joint pain and fatigue and more food allergies? It's likely that these things now we know are all connected to gut health. Or if you are someone who is just erring on the side of fatigue or brain fog, because I think that's a huge one, and you're maybe not having digestive concerns, if it truthfully is impacting your everyday life, and you've tried to mediate with some other lifestyle behaviors, like I feel like I am getting enough sleep, right? And I feel like I am starting to help my nutrition and nourish my body, but it's not really getting better, and it still is very severe, and it's impacting your everyday life, then it's likely that healing the gut on a more deep level is necessary necessary. Does that make sense? Yeah, that's perfect. Um, And I think just one other last topic I'd like to touch on before we end today is the the way that you can test, like you can test to really find out uh, what is actually going on in the gut. Because I guess people think, oh, I I have this symptom or maybe I have this and Mm -hmm. maybe it's this. And you look it up online and you can find terrifying things that you could have in your going on in your body. And that's not obviously the case. And there are ways that professionals can help you to actually test what is going on and know for sure. So could you just talk us through what that looks like? Absolutely. First of all, I think everyone should, if they are suspecting that they have a gluten sensitivity or intolerance, get tested for celiacs while you have gluten in your system because celiac disease is very serious. It is much less common than gluten sensitivity, but I do think it's very important. Sometimes people just have celiac disease and then they go on a completely gluten-free diet, they supplement, and then they're fine. And that's really uh, serious and important to kind of rule out or get a diagnosis. So I think starting there, if you suspect gluten's at the core, um, Um, And then doing things, you can do breath tests, breath tests to uh, detect for bacterial imbalance and overgrowth, uh, to detect for things like lactose intolerance. And both of these first tests you can usually do with your primary care physician first without needing to see a uh, specialist or a gastroenterologist. Of course, if we kind of put these off the table or you need some more support, getting um, you know some other testing done, I do think if you have blood in your stool or any really severe things like that, getting a colonoscopy or an endoscopy, again, to rule out things like irritable bowel diseases, which can be autoimmune and very chronic, are really important. And 
And then from there, it's really helpful to see maybe a gastroenterologist or a functional medicine practitioner or um, a homeopathic doctor to kind of test again deeper for candida, for yeast overgrowth. That's essentially what candida is. It's yeast overgrowth. A SIBO, small intestinal bacteria overgrowth is bacterial overgrowth. So you can have some testing usually via stool, sometimes via saliva or blood as well. And it kind of depends on the practitioner you work with. But recognizing that that's the next level. Okay, wow, I really still have fatigue. I really still have gut issues and pain and all this stuff. I think I need to test out to see maybe if I have that yeast or fungal overgrowth. There might be parasitic infections at play, which you can sometimes see with a stool test. So it would just be going to your practitioner and saying, hey, should I have um, you know, a comprehensive stool lookup? Should, should I have a, a testing of my stool or my blood to really make sure nothing else is at play? I kind of think I would like to go that route. And then your practitioner can really um, help you um, help you along that way. But being empowered to know that you can ask for those tests and you have the right to say, something is not right. I've ruled some things out and it's just not working. I think I need a more comprehensive look at this. And that is totally totally fine and you are worthy of taking that action and being assertive and you know taking charge of your health in that way thank you that is so so helpful and I just want to add like some of these stool tests you know when you get the test back it can look scary it can be like oh I've got this bacteria and I've got this parasite and I've got that stuff but what I would say is it is really easy to address like knowing the issue is the is, is the is, is the biggest part of solving the problem, right? We need to understand yeah. what we're dealing with. And then once you know what it is, even though the, the test looks all scary and it has loads of numbers and red letters and numbers and stuff, once you understand what you're dealing with, it is very, very simple and very easy to take steps to actually resolve what the issues are. Yeah. So don't be put off um, by the fact that you've got to take a stool sample and you've got to go through the testing because it is so worth it, especially if you have tried all the other natural things that we've talked about today and you're making improvement, yeah. but you're not quite getting getting to where you need to be like you're still getting the fatigue or the headaches or yeah. the brain fog or the joint pain and it's just not yeah. shifting then it's worth taking that last step and being assertive um, as Trish says because sometimes you have to ask for those things they're not offered to you and so you have to be really forthright exactly. and saying I really need this because I have tried everything I have addressed as much as I can and I really feel like something's wrong and I need to understand what it is um, so I think that was fantastic advice thank you so much for sharing that with That's us all. today this has been such a great episode and I think there's so much for people to just take from here and start looking into their gut health um, are there any last words of wisdom you'd like to leave the audience with before we end the episode today? Yeah, I, I, I will say that, you know, we talked about a lot of the physiological aspects of the gut, but I think there is this intuitive sense that we have. Our gut is directly connected to our brain via the vagus nerve. So if you know, kind of, you know, uh, piggybacking on our last point that something isn't right or something just feels wrong kind of deep in your gut and it's, it's not your brain just being fearful of making a change or being uncertain, you will have this gut wisdom that can kind of be a guiding force along this journey. And there is some research showing that our gut, you know, has this nervous system and it has these signals that it can give us. So I guess my last word of wisdom would be try and strengthen that gut intuition or that gut wisdom and do listen to your gut as you're on this journey. It might be difficult, but there are support out there and just kind of listen to your gut on what path it is that you need to take. Know it's a journey of trial and error, but it is absolutely possible. Um, people with a myriad of gut issues have healed and felt so, so much better. So know that it might take a little bit of time, but it is, you know, healing and feeling better is absolutely possible. I love that. Thank you so, so much, Trish. Mm -hmm. And if you'd like to learn more from Trish or find out more about the work that she does, then we'll link all her links in the episode show notes so you can catch her there. And for more episodes of the Back to Health podcast, you can catch those links in the show notes too. It's been a pleasure to be with you today. We hope you've found this useful and you've learned at least one thing that you can take away. Let us know what that is in the comments below and we'll be back very soon with another episode. Take care. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode. If you would like any of the links or the show notes, you can follow them in the description below. And for more episodes of the Back to Health podcast, please be sure to follow us on YouTube or you can follow us on Spreaker where we host our podcast. Thanks again. And I look forward to joining you for another episode of the Back to Health podcast. Until then, stay healthy, stay happy and stay informed.